My name is Billy Ogletree. I'm the chairperson for the National Joint Committee for the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities. This group has been in place since the late 1980s and has been all about uh, policy and practice issues uh, for people with severe disabilities, especially in the area of communication, but in other areas as well. Our group is made up of eight member organizations. Each organization offers representatives uh, that meet annually and we get together and talk about policy and practice issues. Uh, what I've uh, tried to put together in this video project uh, is an opportunity for members of the NJC to share their thoughts about uh, policy, practice, or practice tips that may be useful for someone entering uh, and beginning their work with severe disabilities, people with severe disabilities, be they students or be they professionals. So what you'll hear in the next few minutes are the good thoughts uh, of those that work with this population and have done so uh, for quite some time. I hope you can take that information and apply it to your work. The Communication Bill of Rights can and should be used for advocacy purposes. It would be a very effective tool to use to influence policy and practice. And we still, in meetings that we go to or in talking to people, we find out that people are not aware of these rights. And therefore, it is so important to still get the word out, even 25 years later, so that people know how to interact with those with severe communication disabilities and understand and appreciate the rights that they have and that all of us share as communication partners and communicators. And we want to promote these rights widely and we want people to disseminate them and talk about them in the settings in which they work or they live. So if you have in-service programs make sure to include the Communication Bill of Rights. If you're talking to principals, teachers, other professionals, make sure to talk about these communication rights so that people will have a shared belief and value system, those who work with or interact with people with severe disabilities. It's so important to get the word out about these Communication Bill of Rights. When we offer children and adults with severe disabilities an opportunity to make choices, we want to make sure that it's an authentic opportunity. In order for it to be authentic, a certain set of conditions need to exist, and we need to have taught certain elements of choice making. So there is a difference between participating in a choice making opportunity in which we can't be certain that the person really selected their preference and actually making an authentic choice from among meaningful alternatives. So if you hold up an object, if, I, if you were to offer me a choice and you held up two objects and one I was familiar with and the other one was say a car part, I had no idea what it was for or it had any use or I didn't really have any association with it, that would not be offering me a set of options that were going to result in authentic choice making. So the options must be grounded in real life experiences. That's number one, which sometimes is, um, sometimes that doesn't occur for people with severe disabilities. We have to be thoughtful about that, provide those experiences. The second thing is if you're asking me or anyone else to choose from options, we want to make sure that one option has more value to the individual than the other options especially if you're asking uh, someone to select it as like a reinforcement, um, something that you particularly want them to enjoy, then the, they have to have a relative value of one over the other. Um, they also have to understand the representation for the options. So this is not a time to teach them the meaning of a symbol, for example. So if you're going to hold up two pictures or two words that represent the two options, then they need to understand what those representations or those symbols mean or else they cannot make a meaningful choice. Then there are issues around access as well. Uh, is the photo sufficiently enlarged? Have you held it up for a long enough period of time? Uh, do you have a background perhaps? Have you considered whether the person has a visual impairment, cortical visual impairment? the need for a slant board, the need for yellow outlining, or any other the other features that a child with cortical visual impairment or some other form of visual impairment 
might need. And lastly, there's a number of things you need to consider around your procedure in addition to accessibility. For example, are you going to offer each option or representation of an option or symbol for an option one at a time or two at a time or in a larger array? Are you going to, uh, how long will you offer each option? So you want to make sure that each option or representation of an option is offered for the same length of time and in a similar way so, and that you don't bias the person by kind of leaning toward what you'd like them to choose or shaking it more dramatically than the other options. And then you also want to make sure that uh, you have offered a sufficient amount of wait time for the person to process cognitively and to develop a motor response then so that they can display their indicating response. We haven't thought enough about the future when we have the kids in school. So we've been thinking about their communication within the walls of the school and we haven't been future planning enough uh, which may change how we intervene and who we intervene with. So that's one issue which I think is totally correctable. You might be wondering, and in fact I hope you're wondering, about what happens to kids when they graduate high school and the systems that are built in to serving kids with disabilities. What happens to those adults, particularly those with severe disabilities? Unfortunately, many of them experience what we call a falling off the cliff. Uh, the adult service systems are not nearly as comprehensive, uh, nor is the funding and the right to services as strong for adults as they are for kids. So what that means for you, if you are or you do practice in the schools, you need to be carefully thinking through the transition process. So how can we make sure that the hard work that has gone on in helping individuals communicate uh, while they're in the school system carries over to their life as adults? So that's a challenge for you. It's also an opportunity. One of the issues with services to adults with complex communication needs, and particularly those also with severe disabilities, is getting service providers who can provide appropriate services to those adults. And the service provision is and should look very different than it does to um, school-age kids uh, with those same severe disabilities. So uh, one of the things that uh, becomes very clear with adults is that it is the individuals who are their daily communication partners who are the ones who are going to help make the changes and improve communication on a day-to-day -day basis. So as a professional, uh, those what we call direct support professionals who are the paid helpers as well as the families, friends, and other allies are going to be key to making continued improvements and assuring the right to communication for those adults. So it's uh, very different whereas the individuals of the team before were probably uh, teachers, uh, other school-based personnel. Now it is those other communication partners. So the interprofessional team is going to look a lot different for those adults and they certainly uh, are key to uh, continuing the successes that those individuals may have found as children that um, we have an entire population of adults, um, a generation of adults who never received um, access to technology and supports for um, communication intervention. Um, and just quite frankly, the technology didn't exist when they were young, going through school. And some of our perspectives on the use of augmented communication have also changed over time with the research as it has evolved over the years, in the past 30 years. 
And um, I think we just need to remember that there's this generation of adults who are entering um, adulthood, coming out of high school and transitioning, that may be having AAC needs for the first time, or that may be introduced to augmentative communication for the first time. And um, there may be some myths about their development, um, such that they may not some folks may not think that they have uh, the ability to develop new communication skills in adulthood. And I think as um, all adults are continuing to develop throughout adulthood, we must remember that um, adults with severe disabilities are also continuing to develop, and it's never too late to introduce augmented and alternative communication strategies um, to them to support that development. It's never too late to try a new strategy, and don't presume that Everything has been tried once they get to adulthood. Um, that is, they're um, changing and developing, and there may be stresses that are um, reduced from adults by finishing high school and moving into the um, adult world and having support employment opportunities and a different set of team members around them. And um, we need to be mindful that there's not this plateau of, of um, development there and that we need to continue to support their needs. So I'm excited to talk to you about literacy and why literacy is something that we should consider for every individual of any age and regardless of the severity of their disability. The truth is that if you use augmentative and alternative communication to communicate with the world, we have to teach you how to spell or you'll never be able to say everything you want to say whenever you want to say it to whomever you want to say it to. We have all kinds of beautiful solutions to use picture symbols and well-organized communication systems and uh, tactual symbols that are coming out now that we have access to 3D printers. We have all kinds of solutions. But if we're not teaching individuals literacy, if we're not teaching them how to use letters, whether they're in print or braille or auditory format, in order to spell, they'll always be beholden to the words that we put onto their devices or they'll be restricted to the ideas that we have or can come up with based on what they do tell us when they're trying to communicate with us. If they can spell, they can communicate anything they want to. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's easy to teach spelling to everybody in the world. And I think in order to learn to spell, you actually have to learn more about reading and writing. It isn't just about spelling. It's about being able to use spelling to take ideas that you have in your head and translate them into a print form for other people to be able to interact with. That requires that we start from tomorrow, beginning to help people understand concepts of print or braille, beginning to understand letters and sounds and words and how they work, so that over time we can take a comprehensive approach to help people move towards more and more conventional literacy every day. I have a really good friend, and when I first met him at age 11, he didn't have any measurable literacy skills. And in fact, aside from a fairly consistent yes-no response, didn't have a lot of ways that he could communicate and interact with the world. He just celebrated his 32nd birthday, and every day he's getting better at reading and writing and communicating. In fact, just last night, he sent out a, post, a Facebook post to all of his friends, and he asked all of us to pray for him because this afternoon, he's having surgery to revise his baclofen pump. The first time he ever used uh, print to communicate with the world was when he was 17 and that pump was put in for the first time. And his family was very worried about whether or not they should do the procedure. And he was able to use spelling to communicate well enough with his family that he wanted to give it a try because he thought it might help. Now, his family did not program the words onto his communication system that would have allowed him to communicate with them about why he wanted a say in this choice. In fact, they thought they were doing the right thing by trying to carefully consider the dangers of surgery versus the possible relief that he might get. The fact that 15 years later, he's now able to use his literacy skills to reach out to all of the people who know and love him to say, hey, will you pray for me tomorrow? I want to make sure I do good. That that is a testament to what the power of literacy is. Essentially, you know, with interprofessional collaborative practice, instead of trying to do everything yourself or focusing only on your narrow area, you're really working seamlessly with other professionals and with the individual and the family. And I think that is the key throughout the lifespan. You know, people with severe disabilities have 
a complex profile and so they have complex strengths and needs and you can't solve that by yourself. No speech language pathologist or OT or PT is gonna be able to meet all their needs. And so we really need to work together in order to provide the best outcomes. And so I'm currently working in early intervention. So my team is often primarily me and the family. And then, you know, I often start with these kids when they're tiny. I mean, they could be two months old when I first see them and I may be the only person on the team. And then as they grow, the needs shift and change. And then we bring additional professionals into the team. And so we try to work in consultation and collaboration with each other when, you know, I see a child who's now starting to have feeding challenges, then I'll bring in someone with feeding expertise. And I think that's one of the important pieces of interprofessional collaboration is this uh, setting up a climate of mutual respect and shared values where we all have the same idea of where we're headed and we also understand and respect each other's points of view and their knowledge base. So I know which professionals I would call in for feeding issues and that might be different than someone for sensory needs. And so understanding and respecting everyone's individual contribution and that includes the family. And I think too often families kind of maybe aren't as valued or respected in this process, but you know, it doesn't make sense for us to be working on goals as professionals that are not important either to the individual or their family. We all have to be in it together. Both Marianne and I have spoken to groups about and written about, and that has to do with myths that have impacted um, services for individuals with severe disabilities. The kinds of myths that uh, Marianne and I are talking about are, are perhaps a little bit more specific. So one myth has to do with when do you provide augmentative and alternative communication services to an individual? And one of the things that we're addressing is this is not a last resort alternative but actually what we would like people to consider a first line of defense. So historically, what would happen with individuals with severe disabilities, there would either be a protracted period of time where perhaps no services were provided because it looked like the youngster wasn't making any progress. Uh, and the idea that something like augmentative and alternative communication, we can go with the acronym AAC um, was just too difficult, too demanding for these individuals. And we have spent literally our careers in debunking that myth. We have evidence all the way from young toddlers ages two and three all the way to young adults with severe disabilities who have evidence the ability to learn how to communicate using an augmented system. Um, well, I, I'd like to add two myths that um, we have been addressing. And uh, in addition to the one Rose uh, laid out, which clearly is a very important one, that it's never too early and it's never too late to use augmentative and alternative communication. The second myth we like to address is the myth that if you use augmentative communication, it will hinder a child's speech development. And that is a very rampant myth in the field, that um, if you do this, if you give a child a device, that it will really um, affect their ability to learn to speak. And um, we will definitively say that that is not the case. And um, there are a number of research studies that show that children who use augmentative communication can learn to speak and do learn to speak and have some words. Uh, and also that uh, we have done our own research with toddlers with developmental disabilities, uh, children between the ages of two and three, and shown that actually using a speech generating device 
to teach the children new words not only gives them a way to communicate, but also facilitates their speech development. And so the myth that um, AAC hinders speech development has really been debunked with research that is out there. But there is definitely a um, perception and um, misunderstanding that it will hurt speech development, and it does not. Uh, so that's the second myth. And the third myth that we want to highlight today is one about speech generating devices, devices that talk, which are more and more prominent today, more and more affordable. Uh, but there has been over time the idea that for uh, individuals with severe disabilities, you don't use speech generating devices because they're too expensive and you just can use a paper book and that will work for the child. And you certainly can use a paper book. However, a speech generating device in our research and in what we know gives the person a voice. And as everyone knows, a voice is really important. A voice gives you a sense of who the person is. It's an individual identifier and marker. And it permits the individual to tell you about themselves and having a voice becomes very important uh, for anybody. We have examples and statements from adults who are AAC users who say that the worst thing there is is not having a voice and that when you don't have a voice, you're treated like a thing, not a person. And you're talked around, um, you're not a uh, thought of as someone who can contribute to a conversation, but when you have that speech generating device that has a voice, you can be part of the full conversation, which assists with inclusion and with interaction with families. Uh, and so having a voice and using a speech generating device becomes very important. And the myth that we shouldn't give it to somebody because they are too disabled is really one that um, has been debunked, but needs to continue to be debunked, especially in the world where we have iPads and tablets and smartphones that are readily available to everybody.